How do we shape our future right now? Today on The Laura Flanders Show, we speak to author and architect Keller Esterling about the role that architects can take to shape a better world. And we speak with scientist Helen Caldicott about facing the nuclear threat. All that and a few words from me on police and women in crisis, the real versus the seemingly violent. Welcome to our program. Over the last century or so, the ocean floor was laid with thousands of miles of telegraph, telephone, and fiber optic cable. Yet East Africa, one of the most populous areas of the world, had no cable link and almost no broadband until recently. Now cell phone towers are dotting the Kenyan landscape and Kenyans can access the World Wide Web on their phones, but there's still almost no bandwidth for Kenyan businesses or the country's education system. And that's just one example of what our next guest calls the influence of extra statecraft. Non-state actors like space, accountable to no one, she argues, are having a defining impact on our lives. Kella Esterling is a professor of architecture at Yale and the author of Extra Statecraft the power of infrastructure space. The book came out last year from Verso. Keller, welcome to the program. Thanks for coming in. Thanks. Nice to be here. So a lot of our audience are probably familiar with the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the IMF. We know there are these kind of shadowy, super state financial organizations, but you're saying there's a whole population <laughs> of kind of extra state actors that we don't actually know anything about. Well, of course, there's a ballooning number of, of uh, extra state organizations and extra state actors. Um, but I'm sort of been looking at the, the pretty vivid spatial vessels where they operate. Um, so, for instance, free trade zones, or uh, which have become a kind of um, paradigm for world cities. Or, um, uh, so tell us what you mean about free trade zones being a space of action beyond the trading, obviously. Well, they were in mid-century. Uh, a UN promoted um, a way for developing countries to jumpstart their economies and enter the global marketplace. But they set up authorities that were independent from the host country that would grant uh, tax exemptions, uh, deregulation of labor and environmental law, um, all the kind of mantras of free trade, although it's maybe somebody else's freedom. Right. Um, and they, um, the UNIDO thought that these zones would dissolve back into the economy of the host country, but the opposite happened. Everything, of course, wanted to locate in the zone. Why, would, why wouldn't you want to enjoy this kind of lubricated political quarantine and exemptions and taxes and so on? Um, so now, having sort of swallowed the city whole, these free, z free trade zones, special economic zones, there are many different names for them, um, have, have become a kind of contagious um, system. And no one really knows why we use them, except that the world has become addicted to a form of incentivized urbanism. Um, so what's the point of us worrying about our free trade packs? People like uh, things like the... Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, and, and things like that. If these zones give away so many permissions to the companies and, and nations that operate in them, should we not even bother? Well, it, it, they are a, a legalized, stable uh, form of, of corporate externalizing. They are the sort of perfect island of corporate externalizing. Um, and while they used to be, um, you know, in, maybe in mid-century or even in the 70s, they used to be sort of gray warehousing spaces. Now they are megacities. They're sort of the glittering mimics of Dubai and Singapore and Hong Kong and every country. They're in 130 countries. Some of them are measured in hectares. Some of them are measured in square kilometers. And every country, some, often kind of the next poorest country, wants, wants that zone. There's and one you describe right like opposite Hong Kong. Well, Shen yeah, Shenzhen is a, um, a gigantic uh, special economic zone with, with every conceivable program within it. It is, a, it is of course, a, me it is a mega city, and the Washington consensus consultancies and the McKinseys and the 
uh, are still whispering into the ears of every most governments that this is what you need um, to signal that you're ready to be part of the global marketplace and to uh, remedy problems of, of very high unemployment. Mm. So there's the zones, and we'll get back to how this is the business of architects in a second. But you do also, your book anyway, paints a fairly um, shady picture of um, an organization like the International Standards Organization, the ISO. Is it really so bad to have an organization that says there should be certain standards for car dashboards and credit card size and things like that? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to portray them as, um, as a, a, a sort of evil or, or a, a venal group, um, but more as a sort of hilarious uh, uh, group. They are, of course, ISO is the, the organization that um, started in 47 and decides everything from the thinness of credit cards to the pitch of screw threads. And, um, but while they used to... Um, only devote themselves to technical standards like that. I mean, everything we have is covered with ISO standard numbers and so on. Um, now they, now their desire for their universal contact with the world is through management standards. So the kinds of so that the ISO quality management. Um, it's the reason why the person on the other end of the line says, you know, have I, um, you know, talks about quality assurance and right, so your on. Your conversation they, may be yes, recorded for quality, quality assurance maybe, purposes. Right, right. And have I answered all of your questions? It's all about a kind of um, uh, self-reinforcing habitual management ease that that the, that the whole world speaks as kind of Esperanto of of ISO management ease. Um, but it's more and more um, um, ISO hopes to enter into other public arenas to make standards for environmental uh, um, uh, thinking or for city building or for government. So, and for instance, in, in, um, for in environmental uh, management, the ISO 14000 um, standard, they're, they're not es establishing standards for, for instance, emissions. Um, they're est establishing standards for the way we might th think about environment or for uh, what does constitute a ton of carbon so that that can be comparable um, from country to country. Mm. Um, but what, what we often end up finding in, is that these things can sometimes serve as a badge for um, large corporations to enter into a, a country um, as a kind of seal of approval. Um, it's in many ways, it, it, these standards might be a way that some, uh, some corporations raise their standards, but in other ways, they might be a way in which they can inoculate themselves against regulation. I mean, I certainly came away from your book with the sense that there is a global phenomenon acting on us in a way that most of us are unaware. And the places that we typically struggle around things like trade agreements or um, environmental laws or labor laws kind of miss the boat in a sense. But why is this your interest as an architect? I, I can see why activists need to pay attention to this stuff. Um, but as an architect, how does ISO and free trade zones affect you? Well, in the book, I'm I'm kind of trying to ask the reader to think with me a little bit, to kind of unfocus eyes, and see not not only buildings, but the kind of matrix of space and rules and laws in which those buildings are suspended, mm -hmm. and to begin to think about that matrix space as something well, that one might even liken to a kind of operating system or a kind of software that can be hacked. Um, so. My profession is largely focused on those on those objects, on those buildings, and on making things that are um, evaluated for their shape, for their outline, for their silhouette. Um, and I'm kind of trying to think about the ways in which um, space, it, many some of the most radical changes to the globalizing world are being written in the language of that space. And so, for us architects, it would be Pretty, you know, pretty, pretty silly to pull away from the potential power of manipulating them. Now, your name came to our attention courtesy of our mutual colleague, um, David Harvey, your colleague, our guest. Um, he calls himself a Marxist geographer. 
uh, and he talks a lot about the, the, pl the place of struggle that is the city and the importance of city as a place of struggle. How does your work relate to his or, or add to his or, or, or affect it? Right. Um, uh, well, I mean, the, the kinds of things I'm suggesting um, where one might um, take the kinds of incentives that have been outside the city and, and place them back in the city, it's pretty much urbanism yeah. 101. This is, you know, the idea that we know that all of the, the consequences and uh, circumstances and collisions that a city offers, that there is robust intelligence in that in that network that is in, in many ways erased by the sort of ex-urban enclave that that really is a, a kind of isomorphic platform that only that only wants to deal with with um, compatible information. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of special stupidity, a kind of information paradox where enormous amount of information is drawn down and for logistics and um, outsourcing and so on, um, but an enormous amount of information in some ways to remain information poor. Mm. Um, and I'm, if I'm looking at space as an information system, I'm looking for space that, that is, that, that uh, is information rich mm. and, um, and an environment that's information rich. Um, and can I go back to the hacking that you mentioned at the very beginning? We've had some of, I think, your favorite hackers on our show a couple of times, the Yes Men, uh, culture <laughs> jammers, people who kind of call the bluff of uh, our global corporations by sometimes hoaxing uh, the public that they have made statements that they haven't made, uh, usually positive statements that we wish they'd make. Um, the Yes Men, Paolo Chirio, there are a few other people who have kind of play games with the extra statecraft that, that you talk about. Is that sort of the best we can do? I, I love it, but is that the best we can do to disrupt uh, some of this extra statecraft? I, I'm, I'm arguing for something else. I mean, I, 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 I'm learning from, <laughs> learning from all of the tricksters and the hackers. Um, I, I'm, I'm offering slightly different repertoire for activism. Um, like what? And while I... Uh, admire the kind of righteous position of dissent. Um, I'm saying that that uh, that some of these um, uh, spatial variables that can operate in ways that are undeclared can be a little sneakier, a little bit slyer. Um, they operate in the sort of crack between what an organization is saying and what it's doing. So rather than righteousness, there's a there's a great opportunity in discrepancy, in the fictional, in the sly. Um, and there's many ways of operating with space and with different kinds of processes that don't necessarily have to be declared. So one can do, um, so one can make changes that, um, that aren't necessarily the same kinds of changes or righteous positions that are typically associated with dissent. Um, a few uh, a couple of years ago, I had to speak to a convention of zone um, developers, and I tried to tell them, you know, this, I, I'm, I'm, this, I'm a Trojan horse, um, and, but they were very nice about it. And uh, it, it's that kind of audience where I could choose to um, tell a rumor, as, to tell a little lie. Um, but it's, I think that's the kind of yes man. Um, uh, uh, Descent we are that, that you might have been referring to, but there's there's more that we can do with the actual hardware of the city mm. beyond the persuasion, um, beyond a joke or a trick. Um, uh, that that's in, you know, a, a lot more substantial, but that still might deal with different kinds of remote controls or or tricks or. Uh, pandas or um, uh, <laughs> forms of exaggerated compliance, uh, all, uh, gifts, mm. all the things that we typically don't think of as what's appropriate to the righteous political position. Pandas? Um, well, so many of the things that I'm looking at are essentially pandas, which are a gift, the gift you can't refuse, the sweet arm-twisting gift of, um, like, like, the two pandas that uh, that China gave to Taiwan, whose names, when translated, mean unity or <laughs> reunion, um, uh, and many of the space sort of spatial products, the the free zones that Iran offer, the the um, uh, the 
resorts, the, the, the spatial products that are moving around the world, these are offered as gifts, mm. um, as, as arm-twisting gifts, but, but two can play at that game. Um, Keller, thank you so much. You gave me a lot to think about in your book and in this conversation. Extra Statecraft, The Power of Infrastructure Space. Check it out if you're interested in cities, disruption, even pandas. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Physician, author, and activist Helen Caldicott may have done more than anyone else to make the world aware of the threats posed by nuclear power. She's the author of and editor of several books, most recently Crisis Without End, released last year. She lives mostly in Australia, but we caught up with her on a recent trip to New York, where she led a two-day symposium on nuclear destruction at the Academy of Medicine. Here's Helen. When I came here, I was a young doctor. Um, I was at Harvard. Um, I was an alien and I was a woman, but I was deeply concerned about nuclear war as I have been since I read On the Beach when I was about eight, 17, um, about a nuclear war, war. And I was determined that we have to do something about it. And I was asked to write an article for the New England Journal of Medicine on the dangers of nuclear power. And the day after Three Mile Island melted serendipitously, I had a full page ad in the New England Journal about the medical dangers of nuclear power. And suddenly, we had an explosion of doctors joining physicians for social responsibility. So that was serendipity. But I, because of the passion in my soul, my understanding as a physician, because I took the Hippocratic Oath, because really all the world's children are my patients, because I'm a pediatrician, Nothing could stop me, nothing. And I guess that's the message I have to give to the audience today. Each person can be as powerful as the most per powerful person who ever lived. In the 80s, when I founded Physicians for Social Responsibility, I recruited 23,000 doctors across the US and I started similar medical organizations all around the world. And we started to talk about the medical effects of nuclear war. In five years, we were so effective with the media and educating ordinary people that 80% that of Americans became opposed to the concept of nuclear war. The Cold War ended and then everyone, including myself, thought, oh God, that's good, it's over. But what happened was Clinton got in and left the weapons in place when he had a total mandate to abolish nuclear weapons. So the weapons remain in place, but not just that, they're increasing their capabilities and the like, and there are more and more countries getting nuclear weapons because if you develop a nuclear power plant, you've got a bomb factory and you make plutonium for weapons. It really is about love. How much do you love your children? What would you do if your child got leukemia? Would you sell your house, go to the Mayo Clinic, do everything you could, and if your child died, you'd never recover. It's how much do you love your own life? How much do you love the lilacs blooming in the spring, and the roses, and the wisteria? And I made a film once called If You Love This Planet. If you love this planet, you will save it. Will the world end with a whimper or a bang? A bang is nuclear war and nuclear power is a whimper because massive quantities of radioactive waste are being produced every day, 30 tonnes per reactor. We've got over 400 reactors in the world and it's building up and building up. It has to be stored isolated from the ecosphere for a million years according to the EPA. That's scientifically impossible, even for 100 years. As the containers break and leak, which they will over time, within 100 years, but much less, because they're doing it right now, the material, the isotopes, of, there are over 100 elements that can get into the body, will get, get into the water supply and start bioconcentrating in the food by orders of magnitude, crustaceans, little fish, big fish, us, rice, spinach, tea, the whole thing like is happening in Fukushima and Chernobyl. I don't buy European food because much of Europe is radioactive and a constant. And these elements last for hundreds if not thousands of years. So you can imagine generations hence waking up in the morning already having imbibed radioactive material through the air and through the food 
and incidentally it's tasteless, odourless and, and invisible. Um, and it takes, gener uh, it takes many years to develop cancer. The latency period is any time from two to 80 years. Cancers don't identify their origin, but you can imagine our descendants waking up in the morning, the children already being born deformed as they were around Chernobyl. There are houses full of, uh, uh, there are hospitals full of grossly deformed children there. Um, the children being born with genetic diseases of which there are over 2,600 cystic fibrosis, diabetes, I could go on and on. Um, and children getting cancer at the age of six instead of 60 because they're exposed so early to radiation. That's a legacy we're leaving to our descendants. How dare we? And the physicists have known this all along since they started developing nuclear weapons in the Manhattan Project. They've known. That's called evil. Thou shalt not kill and just because there's a long latency period we might not see it right now but although we are I just don't understand that mentality because I've spent my life trying to save lives every one of us can tap into the the profundity of our souls and the purity with which we are born and with which we die and we decide either we will save the creation, 30 million species and ourselves, or we won't give a damn, we'll just sit back. That's where we're at. We're here to prevent suffering, do no damage. And so when you've got an industry that's a carcinogenic industry, like nuclear power, and a weapons-inducing industry, because if you've got a reactor, you can make bombs for the rest of time from the plutonium in the reactor, that, I can't think of any other word but evil. And I'll end with the Einstein quote, the splitting of the atom changed everything, save man's mode of thinking. That was Helen Caldicott, recorded this spring in New York. The nuclear clock is still ticking and arms trading is fueling a suicidal race. There are a lot of things to fear in the world today. I'd like to suggest that African American women be taken off that list. If only we could get the message across to the armed and dangerous men of the police. Not long ago I had a chance to hear from relatives of black women killed at the hands of the police. In more than half the cases those who ended up dead were those most in need of help, not violence. And in just about every incident, the killer justified his actions on the basis that he feared for his life. Michelle Cousseau's mother, Frances, said she called her daughter's mental health facility to check on her. She lived alone and seemed in crisis. Instead of help came cops, and one sergeant in particular who decided to shoot the 5'5", 130-pound Michelle in the heart because he said he felt threatened by the look on her face. Kayla Moore was acting oddly and talking to herself, says her sister, when her roommates called for mental health assistance. And instead of help came multiple police who decided to isolate, restrain, and attempt to arrest Kayla, a transgender woman, by sitting on her. She ultimately suffocated to death. She was seemingly violent, said the police later. There's seemingly violent, and then there's all this death. The stories of Cousseau and Moore and others are written up in a new report from the African American Policy Forum. The fact that black women are rarely viewed as women in distress is literally costing them their lives, the co-authors write. Instead of in need, black women, even when they're experiencing a health crisis, are perceived as superhuman and somehow posing a deadly threat. Such is the power of stereotype. Now me? I'm afraid of warmongers, bomb sellers, the manufacturers of weapons who literally pose a lethal threat to life. Do you think if I decided to shoot one of those in the heart, I'd get away with saying I was frightened? I thought not. Tell me what you think. Write to me, laura at grittv.org, and thanks. Today on the show, Marxist philosopher David Harvey. Capital has always been built on certain fictions. Land is not a commodity that we've made. 
we've turned it into a commodity by establishing private property rights and we're doing things on that sort with knowledge now. And later, activists from Black Lives Matter travel to Palestine. Palestine to Ferguson in the occupation! Ferguson to Palestine, we fight to save our nation! Today on The Laura Flanders Show, writer and activist Leah Lakshmi Piepsner Samara Singha discusses poetry, capitalism, and the difference between disability rights and disability justice. When that, you know, breakneck speed, burnout, able-bodied activist gets cancer or diabetes or, you know, gets an amputation and is like, oh my God, my life's over. We're there to be like, it actually really isn't, but you need to change the way your life is and the way movements are. Mm -hmm.